in the book, there is uh, bad sex and there's good sex. And um, you kind of have to get through the uh, bad sex to get to the good sex, as is sometimes true in life. And so, um, hi. And so, um, so I'm going to read some of the bad sex, and then I'll let you get to the better sex on your own. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything you need to know. I hate when people... No. Okay, I'm not going to preface. I'll just, like, break... I'll stop in the middle. Like, if, you know, I'm like, oh, shit, they're not going to understand this. Okay. Chapter 13. Later, as I waited for Adam on Oceanfront Walk near Marina Del Rey, where the homeless cleared and the vibration of the boardwalk became more desolate, I was so excited that I was nauseated. The Santa Monica Mountains were covered in fog, so the pink and palm tree silhouettes of Venice looked like their own island, an old beach scene frozen in time. It was windy out and I was cold, but I felt important, momentous, like I was on a timeless mission. I could be anyone standing by any beach in history waiting for a lover. I could be Sappho, unafraid of Eros, calling Aphrodite to her shrine. But as soon as I saw him coming, I thought, oh, God, no. He sort of looked like his Tinder picture, but more of a monkey aesthetic than a hot one. Also, he had an additional werewolf essence that the photo had not captured. It wasn't just his jagged teeth, the scruffy goatee, but something else that was distinctly werewolf. He waved to me, and I waved back, cursing through my teeth, already disappointed. When he crossed the street, I tried not to let it show, to be warm, though I wasn't sure why I cared what he thought. I guess I felt bad about rejecting someone without even knowing him. It figured, of course this werewolf monkey creature was the best that I could do. He might have been disappointed in what I looked like, too, but he didn't show it. You're really cute, he said, as though reassuring both me and himself. You look a lot younger than 40, a lot younger. I'm 38, I said. Not that I don't like older women. I love older women. You've got seasoning. But you look like a young older woman, or an old younger woman. Okay, I said, relieving him of having to speak. I got it. So what do you want to do, he asked. Do you want to stay here and have a drink, or do you want to go for a walk? Let's have a drink first, I said. God, you're really cute, he said. We turned into a little dive. I ordered myself a vodka tonic. I needed to be less lucid than I was. He didn't offer to pay for my drink, but he got two tequila shots, offering me one and a Jack and Coke. So what have you been reading lately, he asked, after toasting me with one of his two shots. I had told him over the internet that I was a librarian, and he loved that. He had asked me to wear my glasses, but I didn't wear glasses. <laughs> I'm almost always reading the Greeks, I said. I'm doing a project on the poet Sappho that I've been working on for a number of years, trying to finish it this summer. Oh yeah, I read him in high school, he said. I'm really into the beats right now. Do you like the beats? I liked the beats for a second when I was 14. By 16, I realized they were mostly good for picking out a douchebag. There was something about douches and the beats. They just gravitated there. Yeah, I love them, I said. Who's your favorite? <laughs> Kerouac, he said. I'm really into Kerouac, Burroughs, and Bukowski. Kerouac just keeps it so real. Like, the way he writes his characters is just so legit. I would love to write like him someday. Right, I said. So how about that walk, he said. Outside, it was almost dark. He lit up a cigarette and offered me one. I declined and watched him squint and inhale, then exhale. Clearly, he had studied that move, a James Dean kind of smoking pose. But he was no James Dean, and his hands were even more monkey werewolf than the rest of him. Monkey in the way they curled around the cigarette like they were clutching a banana, and werewolf in the way his arm hair crawled well over his wrist and onto the hand themselves, hands themselves. He was hairy to the knuckle. We started to walk, and I felt like I was going to vomit. I kept wanting to say, you know what, thanks, but I'm not feeling so great, and I'm just going to walk home. Sudden, but, oh, but we kept walking. Suddenly, he grabbed my hand and said, can I kiss you? 
But he didn't wait for me to respond. His palm was sweaty, but his lips were full, and I closed my eyes, and it felt shocking to be kissing someone new. She was in, like, a nine-year relationship. With, like, a basic. <laughs> the new mouth shape was exciting, also strange. Oh, uh, sorry, an eight-year relationship. After eight years, I forgot that lips could come in different shapes and feels. Also, the taste of cigarettes and whiskey was exciting. I was half nauseated and half turned on. I felt rebellious and young. What, he said. Nothing, I said, giggling. You're just cute. Looking at him, I really didn't think he was cute. <laughs> but I didn't know what else to say, so I shut my eyes and took the back of his head in my palm and pulled him toward me. Then he introduced his tongue, much deeper into my mouth, circling it in a clockwise motion. What the fuck was he doing? <laughs> he was ruining it. I started to put my tongue out as a guard to try to stop his rotating tongue, but I guess he just took this as a sign that I was turned on, that I was into it, because he continued with the circling, only deeper in my mouth, almost to my throat. I put my finger up between our mouths, pretending to trace his lips, but really just trying to create some distance. <laughs> then I closed my lips a lot, guiding him into softer and gentler kisses. I kept my eyes sealed shut. I could have just cut it off there. I'm not sure why I didn't. He rubbed my tits over my black cotton dress. I could feel his bulge against me. Then he started kissing my ear and neck, and all I could think about was how my neck and ear now smelled like his breath, which had taken on a sour quality, the whiskey, tequila, and smoke forming a noxious stew. Let's go back to my house, he whispered into my ear. Uh, I don't think so, I said. What if you're a murderer? I'm not a murderer, he laughed. If you were a murderer, you obviously wouldn't tell me. I'm so not a murderer, he said. Well, I'll just walk a little farther, and then I'll decide. Maybe I can pick up some more clues in the meantime. His house was one tiny room that reeked of cigarettes. The mini refrigerator, stove, and oven were right at the foot of the bed, and the bathroom just off the head of it. There was beige wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, even in the kitchen part, with stains that looked like spaghetti sauce, tar, and generally a lot of lint. He had very few books for someone who claimed to be a writer and loved to read. I counted seven, three of them Bukowski. I love Bukowski maybe the best, actually, he said when he caught me looking at the books. Find what you love and let it kill you. So raw. <laughs> I didn't say anything. He put his arms around my waist and began kissing me, then pulled me onto the dirty plaid bedspread and took off my dress. You have such a hot body for 40, he said. 38, I said. Mmm, he said, sliding his fingers into my underwear. I love your pussy, so hot that you have hair down there. I took off his pants. His cock was hard as a stone, yet simultaneously pink and slimy. I didn't want to touch it, so I didn't. He began fingering me very dryly. He kept whispering, can I fuck you? I want to fuck you. Will you suck my dick? I kept saying, no, no, not yet. I'm not ready. I guess in an effort to turn me on, he inserted two more fingers into my wilting vagina, banging them in and out. My labia burned, but I was surprised to find that up inside me I was wet, as though I didn't know I was turned on. Now the wetness began to come down onto my labia and clit. But he ignored my clit and just kept banging away. Such a hot, tight pink pussy, he said. I didn't know how he knew it was pink. He hadn't even looked at it or licked it. Let me fuck it, please? No, I said. Okay, then will you suck me? Just suck me a little, he asked. I want to see those hot old lips on my cock. That was it. You know what I think would be hot, I asked. What would do it for me? I wanted to watch you jerk off a little. He stopped finger-fucking me and looked me in the eye. Really? Oh, yeah, it's the biggest turn-on. I want to watch as you lie there and give yourself pleasure. Jerk that hot dick. I don't know where I was getting this from. When I was in my 20s, I used to like my, wa my boyfriend jerk off. I used to like to watch my boyfriend jerk off, but not this dude. I think I was just trying to get him to come and get out of there without having to touch his weird pink dick and mismatched balls. Lying on the bed, he complied and began to stroke it. I was just like, oh yeah, baby, that's it. I thought about all this subterfuge just to get out of a situation that I had put myself in. Technically, I didn't even need to do anything to get out of the situation except leave. He kept looking at me, and I just wanted him to come quickly. Right before he came, he asked if I could lick it. I told him no, then I wouldn't be able to watch. When he finished, I said it was a hot experience, but that I had to go home and feed the dog. He said that he wanted to do something to me, that it shouldn't just be him who got off. 
I told him that this was wonderful, really, and had been more than enough. Out on the street, I felt free, strangely elated. It wasn't just the joy of escaping him, but the fact that I had come out pursued and wanted something new after my pursuit of my ex all winter. So she's like, okay, so like, the way, the reason why she breaks up with her ex is like, um, she's like ennui, you know, like, we all do in long-term relationships sometimes, or like often, and so she um, gets a flat tire, and then he like comes to change the tire, and she's annoyed at him, and she's like, maybe we should just break up, and he's like, actually, I think we should, and then she's like, no! So that's like, yeah, so she's been chasing him since then. And then there's like an incident with some Ambien and donuts, and then she ends up in, in Venice. <clears throat> okay. Um, oh yeah, all right. Uh, right, on the street she feels fang- strangely free and elated. It wasn't just the joy of escaping him, but the fact that I had come out pursued and wanted something new after my pursuit of my ex all winter. I hadn't gotten three blocks when he texted me. You are amazing, I'd love to do it again. I didn't respond, but kind of squealed. No longer did Adam have to be real Adam. Now he was fantasy Adam again, and I had him and the fantasy in my pocket. Sure, the experience itself had been disappointing and gross, but at least it was different from the disappointment I'd grown used to in my years with Jamie. That's her ex. When he and I were together and the sex was less than riveting, I felt filled with doom after, ennui in my head and suffocating in my chest. It was the same doom I had felt in the car just before we broke up. There was an is there was an is that all there isness. I would go sit on the toilet immediately after he came and rolled over. This was partially to avoid getting a urinary tract infection, but also he, so he wouldn't see me frowning. When he found me sitting there sadly, I told him it was because the sex made me feel such powerful things. But really what I felt was despair that this was all there would ever be, forever and ever and ever, until of course it wasn't. But if Adam wanted me, There were others who would want me, maybe many others, even some who didn't read Bukowski. I imagined a bouquet of dicks, a stack of abdominal muscles like a deck of cards painted across the sky. The hunger in me suddenly felt bottomless. It scared me a little. Hello. Okay, so I feel like probably everybody here knows the general gist of the book, but do you want to finish the description of of what the book is about? Yes. (laughs) So textually, the book is about a woman who moves to Venice Beach for the summer and falls into romantic obsession with a merman whose tail starts below the D. Um, Extremely important. Very important. Thematically, the book, um, I'd say, is an exploration of whether or not you can fill, uh, one can fill one's existential holes with romantic obsession. Okay. That was great. We're going to discuss all of those things. Yeah. So, um, you wrote the book by dictating it. I did. Which I find super wild. Mm -hmm. And I want to know, the first dictation that you made, did you know it was going to be this or did you just start recording one day recording seems weird did you just start talking to your car one day and then you were like wait there is something here so um when i lived in new york um up until four years ago i never thought i was going to write prose i had the poet's pride you know if you're a poet in the 21st century you're like not doing it for the money or the whatever, you know. Well, actually, I guess if you're maybe if you're a Tumblr poet now, you are. But, um, but I never thought I was going to write prose. And um, when I moved, and I used to write poems on the subway. And then when I moved to Los Angeles, I started dictating um, using Siri and the Simple Notes app in my car. And um, and my work started getting the line breaks disappeared, and it's everything started getting really long. And that's how I ended up writing the essays for So Sad Today. So after I finished So Sad Today, I still was not done exploring, um, we'll call it love as addiction. I won't call it love addiction, I'll just call it love as addiction. And so, um, but I, I was trying to write poems again, I felt like it was the same poems I had written before. So 
um, I was on the beach in Venice, and I was reading this book called The Professor and the Siren, and it's about um, a man's love affair with a mermaid, and it suddenly dawned on me how dark the whole human mermaid thing has always been. I, like, just, I guess I just didn't like realize. Um, like, I don't know, The Little Mermaid, I was like, never my thing. I actually do have a thing for Ursula the Sea Witch, but that's like a whole other thing. She's hot. But, um, so, um, and I was like, why is it always a merman, or a mermaid? And why is it always a dude, like an older dude? What if it was a merman and a younger woman, or an older woman, and like, what if it was right here on Venice Beach? And um, I was like, but I can't write a novel. Like I was, I never thought I could write a novel. But then I was like, well, I dictated so sad today. So what if I just try to dictate like three paragraphs a day? And so I just did that. And then like nine months later, I had the first draft. Did you start at the beginning? I started right at the beginning. And then when you, did you like get home, listen back and you're like, okay, tomorrow I pick up here or did you There was no going back. Okay. I don't, and I've, um, there's no going back. Um, I, well, first of all, I use a trans, Siri translates everything, so I, so I don't even have to play it. Um, That's true. Yes. Like, it, like, but it's all wrong. So there's no going back. I don't look at anything. I have, I then end up with this giant document, a massive text document that is like half completely wrong and I have no idea what the fuck it says, but at least the clay is there. And then, like, and so after those nine months, I was like, all right, now I have to like try to figure out what I was actually trying to say, but at least it's there. And like some of it's right, you know? Yeah. And then Sappho plays a big part in the play because the main character, Lucy, is writing her thesis. Is it a thesis or a... Something you know what? Word. Somebody in a review just pointed out that it's um, supposed to be a dissertation. Her dissertation. Maybe the paperback will correct it. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, on Sappho. So was Sappho part of the... And then, of course, it no spoilers, but it weaves through with the story. Was that always going into... Did you know that, like, oh, Sappho is also going to be part of the story that I'm telling? No. I mean, my it's weird. Like... My merman and Lucy, my, my girl, um, were like born almost at the same time, like in a way to me, like the Pisces, you know, like I just knew her character. Like I just knew it as soon as I just knew it. But um, Sappho, I was like, well, what does she do for a living? And it's like, if somebody is like a mechanical engineer, they like might not be as likely to see a merman. You know what I'm saying? But if you're like writing a thesis on Sappho and you're like steeped in the Greeks and you're like, kind of in flight from reality anyway, you like might see a merman. Yeah, and that's another thing because you're reading it and like when I read it, I knew it was a merman. So it's revealed sort of not immediately, but you're like, is this, is it real? Is she really seeing it? And I think that whole part of like, you'd know, the book, like, it starts with all these experiences, like horrible sex, Tinder dates, that are extremely hashtag relatable. And then this fantasy element, and you're like, am I, do I follow it? Do, is this like, a, uh, is it like a fantasy thing? Is it a real thing? How did you, I don't know, there's like a tension created between reality and fantasy. Um, how did you sort of navigate that and tease that tension throughout well first of all what i'll say okay so when people ask me if theo the merman is real i say this is my answer i always say he's as real as anyone we're ever like romantically obsessed with you know like how clearly do we ever see another person how real are they the way we see them um the book prior i don't know where alexis my editor is but um Prior to Alexis working on it with me, um, the book could have been maybe even two separate books. It was like very fragmented. Like there was, and I knew, I knew that this book was going to have like human sex and mer sex. Like it was very clear to me. But I think like I needed um, the editorial help to kind of like, Theo didn't come in till like halfway through the book in the beginning. And it was very like two distinct entities and I had to kind of weave it. Um, but I knew there was, I was like, there has to, because that's what was, to me, that was what was going to differentiate it from like a romance or a, um, I don't know. It's like the fact that there's like, like disappointing sex, just like, it makes everything better in, in literature, I think, you know? 
So, yeah. I mean, I believe that he is real. Theo and also in order for her real. to meet a merman. Yeah. Yeah. But as things develop, I'm like, like, ah, what's what's going to happen? Um, because I don't know. It plays with your sort of version of like real and fake or like real and fantasy or whatever. Um, but I think what's really interesting is when I was, I was like browsing it back to see just what I had highlighted. <clears throat> and I remember after I got out of like a really terrible relationship and I had started seeing somebody new that I wrote down on like my iPhone notes, don't forget about real life. And I, and that was like, I kept seeing that and I'm like, what is it about sort of that experience that makes us go into another world? That's really intense. You know? Anyways, that's what the book is about. <laughs> so there's a word called limerence. Okay. Limerence is the feeling you feel in the early days of um, a relationship. It's the dopamine. It's like the good shit. Um, and it is also the thing you feel when you don't even know another human being, but you look at their avatar and you plan like your future together, you know? That's all, and I love, well I love dopamine, but I love limerence, it's like, mm. And so for me, after I've, but limerence is not super sustainable in a long-term relationship. Like I believe in a long-term, in my experience, you have these cycles, right, and you like keep like you fall back in love and then you know there's like days where you're just you know because it's very hard to get high on the person that you're like buying toilet paper for you know <laughs> they're real they're real and a fantasy person for me I'm like well if this person can be magic and they see me as special then maybe I'm magic too but with the person you like you know are like like can you microwave a yam for me you know what I'm saying? Like, it's hard to, um, f you know, it's hard to sort of make it the, uh, the Romeo and Juliet with um, Leo and Claire Danes that for some reason, I just, for me, like, and in the art, I've always liked, I mean, that's not like my favorite art, but I, I do love that movie. But um, in the art I've always liked, it's like, love is... Um, it's impossible. There's distance. There's limerence. There is longing. And so it, it created for me a lot of questions about, well, if love is easy, if there's an easy love and you're not fighting for it and you're not, am I going to hear from the person and you're not getting that dopamine spike, like, how do you come to accept that as like that, is, you know, as, as a love that is just as as much worth having? And these were the questions that were plaguing me when I sat down to write this book. Did the did you have an interest in mermaids before you were given this book no um i'm a pegasus girl you know if i were going to yes. choose a mythological <laughs> creature pegasus mermaid mermen are not even in like the top five mythological creatures i would get with like apollo twink um <laughs> cerberus the hound of hell okay, okay. right um Maybe like Cersei from the Odyssey, but I feel like we'd like hook up and then just end up becoming friends. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a cool thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, Merman's not in my top five. I mean, there haven't even been that many Merman on movies, just like Fantasia, right? Mm hmm. Anyways, and I was thinking also how it's fucked up that even though historically, historically, mermaids are women that drag men to their deaths in Little Mermaid she had to like give up her shit to go be with the man on earth and that's like fucked up but that's not that's dark too right dark. yeah there's a lot yeah that relationship between human and mer person where one of the two usually the person on land occasionally in the disney version the ocean but when the person on land gets one taste of that siren nectar and is like i'm ready to die you know like that to me is everything I want in a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I chose the merman. <laughs> how, <clears throat> how is the process of figuring out the merman's anatomy? And did you at any point, uh, were there sketches involved? Um, it's, as we discussed, it starts, uh, the tail starts below the D. Okay. Um, d but yeah, you were just like, yeah, just, that's where it starts and that's it. 
there are probably some mermen fundamentalists who are not going to be pleased with my construction of Theo. Um, I am attracted to people without penises often, you know. For me, though, for whatever reason, my merman had a penis. You know, yeah. like not all mermen have penis. Not all, hashtag not all mermen. But yeah. um, I knew that my merman, like, I was just like, he has, like, Theo has a dick. It's just the way things go. So um, I, knowing that from early on, I mean, before probably there was any text on the page, because I, I let it, I, like, sat, and I didn't, I let it, like, sit for, like, a couple months, being like, can I write a novel? Like, is this possible? Before I decided to dictate it. And, um... Um, I just constructed him how I needed him to be built. And then I knew what he was built like. Um, in my mind, I'm not a visual, I'm not good at drawing. And, um, but it was funny because I didn't think about his ass. And then like, I feel like an early reader was like, so does the tail start below the ass too? Or like, there were little things like, my husband, who's my first reader always, and like my best editor, was like, okay, so Theo wears a lo like so he wears a loincloth. That's not a loincloth. It's a, it's a sash. And like I did that because some, you'll see. Eventually, he comes on land, and you can't have the stuff. I just didn't want it flopping around. You know, it's, it, yeah. I didn't want to have to like always be writing about like where it was going. Well, it you would know? be dangerous when he like goes on the rocks. He might get scratched. Exactly. It's, yeah. With, it's abrasive. Mm -hmm. With a loincloth. You know where it is. It's all tucked away. So my husband's like, where did he get a loincloth? And I'm like, she's talking to a merman. Like, they're going to have sex. And like, you're asking me where he got the loincloth. They have a store. It's Chekhov's loincloth, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but so the, lo the loincloth um, uh, was from a shipwreck. And I wrote that in. So there were little details. But I really, m m uh, Theo for me was like born pretty whole. What did we... Where did we end on the butt? Does he have a butt? He does he have a butt. He has a butt. Right? He has a butt. Yeah. It, it doesn't come under into the... play, though, really. Like, there's no, I don't think we ever I ever talk about Theo's butt in the book. No. No. Okay. That's... I don't know why. I'm sure it was really nice. I mean, yeah. It was. Yeah, he's hot. I mean, he's my kind of, you know. He's yeah. not for everyone. No. But um, he doesn't have to be. I'm working on the screenplay right now, and the, um, you know, the, I know that Hollywood has, like, beefcake in mind, and I'm like... For me, it's like, you know, that kid from, um, what's that movie with Kevin Spacey a long time ago? American Beauty, like the lost kid with the paper bag. Like, that's my merman. <laughs> I was is... thinking Timothy Chalamet. Yeah, that's hot too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. But if the movie ever gets made, it'll definitely be someone like, probably not as twinky and hot. That's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Um, another thing, obviously the the ocean figures a lot in the book, not just because um, of the merman. And I'm thinking like, what is it about the ocean that is so female? Mm. And like, just do, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, because, okay, here's what I, I, as you mentioned Tumblr before, I'm also on Tumblr and I feel like there is a certain kind of uh, girl who loves to reblog a picture of the ocean. Like, I see a picture of the ocean, I'm like, this is like, this is me. <laughs> um, and I wonder if you had ever thought about that, because I'm always like, why, what is it about the ocean that feels like such a female energy? It's an interesting question. Um, well, the mystery of the ocean in general, I mean, if you think about it, like, if you want to just take it to a, um, like a cis level for a second. Um, dicks are pretty self-contained. I mean, you know, m even minus the loincloth. Like, you know, yeah. the vagina does, is doing something different every day. You know, like it's never the same vagina twice. And I feel that way about the ocean. You know, it's like, okay, now like on a non-cis level and just like female energy in general, um, like the containing of multitudes and the fact that like, um, the top of the ocean can be totally chaotic. There can be a storm. You know what I'm saying? Like, it can be total chaos. And underneath, like, way underneath, um, there's total silence. And I don't even know if that's a female thing. It's just something I like a lot. Um, because for me, it sort of often felt like the opposite in my life. I feel like I've had to kind of fake like being okay and underneath there's like a lot of chaos 
um, because I didn't feel like I could allow myself to like show that vulnerability, you know? I mean, you know, now they're so sad today, but like before that, um, but even right now, you know, like my heart was beating when I was sitting up here and I was like, if I have to get into child's pose, like would that be, that would be weird. So, um, but there's something really beautiful to me, especially cause the world we're living in now, it's like the news cycle is like four hours and everything is so chaotic. But then it's like, but under the ocean, like the ocean doesn't give a shit. Ocean gives no fucks. Okay. I'm glad that, yeah. I feel good about my reblogging of pictures. You should compulsively reblog and pictures come of visit. the ocean. I will. Oh, I saw your picture on the New York Times. I was like, that's exactly how I imagine the setting, which yeah. I was really into. The rock. Yeah. Um, that also brings us to the void. Mm. The void, which is also a character slash subject. I feel like a bit of a character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, have you? I don't know if you've come across. I'm going to qu quote a tweet, an art tweet. This, um, this, it was like, I think it was a meme or maybe it was art. Anyways, this girl called Audrey Wolin, she wrote this thing that's like, beware male artists making artwork about emptiness. Nothing does not belong to you. Girls own the void. Back up, fuckers. Um, and I, I think everyone is like afraid of the void. But you, I don't know if embrace is the right word, but maybe embrace, let's go with embrace. In like, in your poetry, in your essays, like in your work in general. And I wanna talk, um, like how, how did you get close to the void enough to be like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about it and it's gonna be like a, a thing that I like interact with. I didn't come to the void. <laughs> the void came to me. Yes. Um, no, I feel like I, all my life I've been very aware of this like hole. Um, and we call it like an existential hole, right? The void, the gap. And I've tried to fill it with so much stuff. And I'm a human being and I'm probably going to keep trying to fill it with external stuff. You know, whether it's like right now it's achievement, you know what I'm saying? Because I like a book just came out. So I'm like, what's the next thing? Like what, you know, what's the next review? And like up at four in the morning, like, you know, that kind of. So right now it's achievement. But I, I mean, it's been alcohol and drugs. It's been, you know, um, you know, shopping's always great. Um, and like buying and returning shit and like, um, you know, sex. I mean, you know, I, I spent I spend a number of years filling with that. And, um, uh, you know, there's been a lot. And um, I'll I'll probably always look outside myself because like God or a higher power or whatever you want to call it. Like for me, it's just kind of like the quiet place within. Like when I meditate, that stillness in the ocean, it's not like my first choice. You know, like it's not, I don't think when I'm having like a bad day, I'm not like, let's go get quiet. You know, like, let's go get under all the, like, no, like, I'm like, let's go like buy some shit, like try to look cute, like fuck someone and like get some validation on Twitter, you know? And so... Um, I've always been aware of these holes and I, while I have often felt in my life that they maybe are a design flaw, um, you know, like the more that I sort of, the more, I'm not saying I've embraced the holes cause I haven't, but like the more that I accept that I'm probably like never going to be like, like finished, like it's a life is like a little easier. Like I don't torture myself as much about them being there. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, that's the thing. It's like, you know, it's there. You can't pretend it's not there. And that's really like the best that you can do to so be like, I see you. Like when you see a ghost or something and you're like, I know you're there. Like be a good, be nice energy um, or whatever. Um, do you want to? That's cool. Have you seen a ghost? I have not seen a ghost. I have not seen a ghost, but. I feel like maybe one time I had like an experience with like a Virgin Mary kind of situation because when I was little, I was raised Catholic. We watched this movie about the little three kids. Um, I think they're in Lourdes, Lourdes. I don't know how to say that in English, in Portugal. And they like see the Virgin, blah, blah, blah. And I saw the movie and I was like, why isn't it me? But at the same time, I didn't want it to be me because people that see visions always have like really fucked up lives afterwards. So it was like, ugh. Um, and I remember one day waking 
up from this dream that I had that I was like laying in the back of my mom's car and this like face appeared on the rear view window and it was like an alien and then it became like the Virgin Mary and I woke up and I was like, does that count in a dream? Cause like, I mean, you know, and then I think I, it counts. Right? And then one time I was at my uh, uncle's mom's house and they always were talking about weird shit and I smelled heavily the scent of roses, which is said to precede um, a virgin. And I was like, oh my God, where is she? So that's as, like as close as I get to a ghost. But I think now we have to <laughs> we're awesome. wrapping up with this story. We are opening up the floor for questions from the audience. And go ahead and raise your hand and I'll bring you a microphone. Okay, so like no one in LA asked questions and like Everyone in Philly asks questions, so just so you know where you stand. <laughs> so you know what the competition is. Hi. Hi. Um, because I got to read one of the early versions of the book, this is about something that I imagine has changed based on what I've heard about this one. There was something very rambunctious about the early version about Lucy's behavior that almost, to me, as a not rambunctious person, made it almost seem like a farce, you know, like hard to identify with. What was it like for you to sweet, I don't want to say sweeten her, but to make her something that would be more tragic that I think more people could identify with. Does that make sense? Totally. Really, I just cut out a couple of fucks. <laughs> like there were just, like there were too many fucks in there. Yeah. Some fucks had to be removed. Also like, you know, my editor was like, all right. Like my editor was very patient. She's like, love the one scene where she's prepping herself intimately for anal. Don't need to do it three times. <laughs> You know? So I think I just, it was an editor. Yeah. Yeah. Having an editor who's not like, you know, going to go along with all your bullshit. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I was thinking about how you were writing this like while dictating and more like the logistics, I guess, of like, you, you have to like say like period so that Syria will put a period and d did you dictate the punctuation too or did you like go back after and fill that in and did that like interrupt your flow ever while you were talking to the phone? No, actually I think I typed the period. I don't think I ever realized that. I think, cause I, I do it on the microphone. It's like da 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 and then I'm like, I my phone on me. I don't know. I might, I think I typed the period. I don't think I say period. But I might start. <laughs> Can you talk a, a little bit about how you came to the title? I mean, obviously, he's a fish boy. But is it more like they're kindred spirits or just uh, how you came about it? I was so happy when I found my title. Um, well, OK, so there's a lot of Greek themes in the book, right? Because she is writing her thesis on Sappho. I felt that she was a Pisces from very early on. Um, I'm a Virgo, I'm the opposite. If astrology's real, which like, it, you know. <laughs> Leia was my editor, I, so, Leia was my, I wrote horoscopes for Lenny, letter for, well I still do for a couple years. Leia was my editor for like two years and I'd always just be like, astrology is bullshit, but you know, if it's real, this is like what you shouldn't do this month. So, um, <laughs> so, I, so I knew Lucy was a Pisces, I'm a Virgo. I'm like, she and I are similar in a lot of ways, but like, I make a lot more lists. Like, she's a little more scattered than me. Um, and so, I knew she was a Pisces, and then like, I had the imagery, like, and it made sense, like, the Pisces are two fish, and there's like a lot of things in the book talking about, because it's about like that idea of like, do we need someone else to complete us? And like, are we half a person, or are we a whole person, or like, what all that shit, you know? And so, um, so I think at one point I was like, I'm gonna call this book like Pisces Rising. And then I was like, that sounds like, like James Patterson or one of those dudes you like get in the supermarket or whatever. And then I was like, what about the Pisces? I was so happy. Cause I get really nervous about like endings and titles. Um, like endings, I'm always like, like with poems, I always end them too quickly because I'm like, I have the ending, let's just get out, you know? Like, get out now. And with the title too, it's like, yeah. So that was, so the Greek theme, obviously, because you know astrology is Greek, and I, and I talk a lot about like the, mytholo the mythology of the Pisces, and it was really cool because it's, 
The Pisces is tied into Aphrodite, and Aphrodite is um, like one of Sappho's muses, so it all fit together in one of, it was awesome when that happened. Question over here. Oh boy. Uh, could you yeah. just pass that up? Um, so uh, there's a lot of uh, mention like mental health and the her support groups and you know those words like triggered or unavailable. Did you do any like real life research and like meeting people and going to those groups or did you uh, you know be, c come up with it all yourself? I've basically been in like every kind of therapy you can be in, so it really came. I didn't like go out and do any research because it was just I knew you know. <laughs> Yeah, it was already, the research had already occurred. And it was called me trying to stay alive. Hi. Um, Hi. Well, this is kind of a broad question, but what was like the most special part of writing this novel for you? Like what felt the best for you personally? Honestly, like there are so many things, it's, which is cool, you know? Because um, I always like when prose writers would be like, my characters and like we have a relationship. I was like, what the fuck are they talking about? And now I'm like, my characters, <laughs> we have a relationship. I mean, I think so many things were special. Um, even just the books that inspired it, first of all, um, I'd say, you know, The Professor and the Siren was one, but also um, The Lost Daughter by Elena Ferrante and Death in Venice by Thomas Mann. I read all of those like in a row. And there's always like this out, well, like, I feel like. Sometimes this alchemy happens where like the stuff you're reading and like the stuff you're dealing with internally and like everything just kind of like comes together and that's like the magic, you know? Um, and that's when writing is like pleasurable. Um, and so that was really exciting to me. I also, I started writing it after I'd finished writing So Sad Today, but before So Sad Today was published. And um, it was really nice to just be in the work and be writing like on the book tour, working, dictating this next thing because it's like, I didn't have to be, I could be a touch divorced from like, um, like measuring my own, like, cause there's, you know, like we measure, the, the measuring of the self-worth in like, the, like what I was talking about, like the 4 a.m. like clicks and like the whole like marketing and sales and stuff. There was like a part of me the whole time that I was out promoting the Pisces that I was like, okay, I remember why I do this. And it's just about creating the work. No one saw it. No one knew that I was, I don't think anyone, I mean, my husband knew I was working on it, but um, it wasn't until I, I um, after I had the first draft that I showed it to anyone and I was like, this could really be crap. Like I really, um, I really had no idea. And um, so just to be like, in the work, um, and right now I'm working on, um, I'm dictating two more, well I like finished it, I'm working on two more novels right now. And um, again, right, like it's like, I mean you don't know that they'll get published, you don't know like what will happen, but it's like, just to be like, oh yeah, this is why I do this, cause like, what the fuck else am I gonna do, you know? Like it keeps me kind of like okay with being alive. Hmm. If that makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Sure thing. Just hang tight. Hi. Okay. Hi. So um, this might be a little bit intense, but uh, my question is, how do you think that the main character's sense of self-worth changed over the course of the book, like internal versus external versus other things? And also, how does that relate or not relate to your own journey? But feel free not to answer that last one if it's too personal. Oh, it's fine. Personal, you know. <laughs> um, so, well, I don't want to give too much away. But I will say, I'll say this. You can be, like, really, you can not like the medicine that you're taking, you know? And, like, you can, like, rail against it and think it's like cheesy. Like I have this relationship with like corporatized like self-care jargon, you know, the way it's been like monetized. You were just talking about that, like the word triggered, like it's like, it's been like done to death. You know, it's like been made into like a money-making like clickbait, like I don't know. Like when things get turned from something that's like helpful to like 
um, a product, like, I sometimes just feel a little weird. Like, I'm just like, ew, and I want to make fun of it, basically. It's just my instinct. So you can, like, and there, and there is a bunch of that in this book. There's a lot of, like, psychobabble and stuff. And she, Lucy is very, like, what, like, fuck this shit. Um, and in my life, there have been things that I've really embraced to help me and, like, easily embraced. And then there have been things that I've been like, ew. But just because the medicine is, like, gross... Um, or you like feel like you're like doing everything in your power, like not to let it help you. Um, sometimes like it can still help you, you know? And like, sometimes like a group of women maybe can save your life. So, but you know, that being said, like, I don't know in my personal journey, I don't know that it's ever like, I think the more like one, the more I've like aspired to be, like in my 20s, I, oh, this is the last thing I'll say, in my 20s, I was um, very like on the quest to be whole, you know, and I was like, like drunk all the time reading like books about the Buddha and like, you know, like talking about like on psychedelics and being like, I saw the truth, you know, and like, I, I really felt like anyone outside of me had the answer, like psychics, tarot, like anyone, anyone that wasn't me. And it's like, it's been a relief to be like, well, maybe I don't like really need to like be fixed, you know? And maybe like it is, I mean, it's annoying that the answer's within. It's like so annoying because I don't feel like going in there. <laughs> but it's like, it's also nice not to have to like spend all that money on like tarot readers and stuff. <laughs> the end. <laughs> all right, thank you.